Okay, so we are resuming this this fascinating little, dare I call it a story. Whenever he saw someone coming, Master Lusu or Rosso turned and faced the wall. End of story. Okay, now yesterday we heard a bit of the sort of, uh, you know, really kind of hyperbole of praise on this teaching from Master Wan Song, who, by the way, his dates are uh, 1166 to 1246, China, known as Bansho in Japanese. He wrote this little introductory appreciation for each koan. I'm not going to read it again, but it was about um, how, how fabulous this teaching is in a nutshell. And um, I thought I'd just tell you a tiny little bit about Bancho, um, a little snippet. He studied meditation first with Master Shomoku, who told Bancho, studying this path is like refining gold. When it is impure, the pure gold doesn't show. So the gold's there, but it's not yet showing. And then this master Shomoku said to Bansho, this is when he's a student, as I look between your eyebrows, there is very much something there. If you don't pierce through cold bones once, you won't be able to cast this thing off. He's saying this, you know, you've got to really see through everything and then you can be free of this thing what's that thing well we'll get to that hereafter see for yourself it's not really a matter of my speaking much then bancho was given the saying this is really a koan from chosha an earlier master to sit with which the, what he was given was this by his master Turn yourself back into mountains, rivers, and earth. That's the teaching, the koan he was given. Turn yourself back into mountains, rivers, and the earth. And that, that's, that's like a, it's just the, I actually haven't heard that before as a koan, but it's, I've heard sort of similar things, but not exactly that formulation. I mean, that is, that is exactly what every koan is inviting us, encouraging us to do. Turn yourself back into mountains, rivers, great earth. How on earth can you do that? You know, we kind of maybe just add a little hint that you couldn't do it if it wasn't already the case. So for months, Bancho met with no success sitting with this koan. Six months, it says. Of course, that's nothing. Six months is nothing. Um, many stories of masters sitting for six years, 10 years, 15 years, 30 years. And finally, something collapses. Um, and um, after these months, Shomoku said, I only hope you will understand later maybe somewhere down the road kind of thing. And finally, it actually does not say how long, after a long time, just after a long, long time, doesn't say exactly how long, Bancho did suddenly have an insight. He suddenly turned himself back into mountains, rivers, great earth. He suddenly did do that. Um, and like I said, I mean, if you just, if you put that little mini biography together with the opening comment of his teacher, studying this path is like refining gold when it's impure, the pure gold doesn't show. In other words, <clears throat> turning yourself back into mountains, rivers, and great earth is allowing the gold to show itself again. So it's, 
it's uh it's not that he has to make something different happen that isn't already present it's burning off the impurity i mean impurity is a little bit of a sounds like a slightly moralistic kind of a word which isn't really appropriate in this context actually <clears throat> okay so that was the, the just recapping we get the we get the little introductory bit and that was written by bansho or wansong that was a little story about same bansho wansong then we get the koan itself whenever he heard something someone coming whenever he saw someone coming rosa turned and faced the wall that's our koan and yet then we also get a little comment by Nansen, his Dharma brother, saying, man, if he keeps going like that, he's not going to help anybody. But somewhere we can just detect a little bit of deep appreciation, even in Nansen's comment. Nansen says, here am I sort of sweating it out, trying to tell people oh, it's boundless emptiness, try to realize it, it's got no time, you know, all this kind of stuff that we often do actually in as Zen teachers in our line anyway, and I've ha I haven't really helped anybody, maybe half a person, says Nansen. But what chance is there for Rosa? Who's he going to help like that? Well, here we are, perhaps being helped Rosa's way. Um, then the last part of the whole little parcel of the koan is the verse written by Hongji, I know I'm throwing a lot of names at you. Um, hopefully, it's not too unclear. Hongji is the great master who compiled this whole collection and wrote these verses for each koan. And actually, he was the teacher of Wan Song Bansho. Hongji is a really important figure in Zen. He, he's, he's often associated with a practice called silent illumination which actually oddly is, is set in some ways kind of against or in as, as, a, as a different method than koan study. Um, the idea in silent illumination is, is really associated with the practice of shikantaza or just sitting, which Dogen was a great advocate for, Dogen being 13th century Japanese master um, and, you know, it's, it's often thought to be like the, the practice of there are these two great schools of Zen, really, in Japan, Soto and Rinzai, which indeed come from China. There was uh, Chao Dong became Soto and Linji became Rinzai. Those were two of the five main forms of Zen in China, and they were the ones that flourished most became the sort of major, I guess, sects of Zen practice, forms of Zen practice. Soto being associated with just sitting or silent illumination. Rinzai more with koan training. And um, actually, I'm going to just read a tiny little bit I wrote on, for this talk really, on Sambo Zen, this kind of Zen that we're doing which I've been trained in. And um, the Sambo Zen is a little bit unusual in that it has these two kinds of Zen in its heritage. The Dharma transmissions that it has from each of these two main kinds of Zen, Rinzai and Soto. You know, we, we, um, we don't really see them as opposing in any way. I think they're both helpful. Um, it's interesting, actually, uh, because we can sort of see both of them operating here in this koan. You know, the soto that tends to favor the just sitting, there's rosa, just sitting. And on the other hand, um, you got Nansen. Try this, try that, realize this, realize that. You know, that's a little bit more like the Rinzai. Re wake up, wake up, you know. The main practice of Soto, again, is to sit without any agenda or even method. 
you know you, you're not you're not even asked to sit with a breath you, you just sit there sit there see what happens you know, kind of thing in rinzai on the other hand koans yeah they're commonly used and awakening is explicitly acknowledged and the the metaphors of practice and the rinzai side involve breakthrough and integration whereas in soto one metaphor you sometimes hear is it's more about weeding a field pulling out the invasive species tilling the land more like a farmer letting the land become sort of native and sort of in a sense clean um, allowing a slow natural maturation is enough just give it time don't really try to do anything that's possibly a way you could put the the soto way but sambo zen you know i guess we we sort of have the view that both ways have their place for some it may be a matter of breakthrough experiences happening and then koan study going on and at some point we're ready to drop all of that and come to the just sitting practice which you know some sense sambo zen sees as the sort of the the real gold standard is like just sitting really but many of us aren't apparently ready to really do that um but for others you know it, it may just be just sitting all the way it's fine Actually, in either case, we tend to start with mindfulness of breath. And um, I, I'm encouraging four foundations of mindfulness, really. There's a preliminary practice that, in a sense, we never outgrow. as the best possible foundation for practice. Um, but, you know, this, this, just a side note here, I don't want to take us too far down this rabbit hole, but the... Um, the notion that um, there are two kinds of Zen and, you know, Soto just does just sitting, doesn't do koans, Rinzai just just koans and not just sitting. It's not really accurate. For example, right here, we've got one of the main proponents of Soto Zen, Hongji, just sitting, silent illumination, putting together a collection of koans. What's that about? The collection of koans is filled actually with practitioners who are in the Rinzai tradition. And um, Hongji had a, actually, at a certain point, he had a kind of a seemingly public kind of debate ongoing with another master called um, Da Wei, contemporary of his who was a strong advocate for Cohen's and they kind of had at it in some ways publicly about, you know, nah, don't do it that way. No, don't do it that way. But then um, at uh, Hong, Hongji requested that at his funeral, this sort of supposed adversary, Darwei, give his eulogy. So it wasn't, in other words, the seeming sort of, you know opposition or something between these styles is really not actually how it's how it actually happened in reality there's a lot of interweaving and back and forth and people training in this school training in that school so what we're doing in sambo zen is is perfectly natural to acknowledge these two styles to acknowledge that us we humans may favor, may be helped temperamentally more by one than the other or both. It's all good. We're, we're just trying to become, you know, more alive and helpful and kinder and wiser any way we can. And this sitting practice seems to be an absolutely primary way to, to do that. Of course, it's not the only way. There's, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's got its value for some. Anyway, now I want to get to what Hongji or Wanshi had has to say about Rosso facing the wall. He's got this little verse. Here we go. First line. 
flavor in plainness, it wonderfully transcends thought and speech. There's a, there's a flavor in plain things. You don't have to have rich, spicy deliciousness. There's a deliciousness in the plain. Rosso just faces the wall. How plain can it get? You, you get the point? Just sitting. It's a rich flavor. It's a wonderful flavor in the simplicity. And it wonderfully transcends thought and speech. You can't think about it. It won't help to think about it. This is a helpful point right here about koans. What are they? How do they work? What's the point of them? Well, I want to just wind back here a moment and consider what is a koan. And one way is to contrast it. What is not a koan? Well, it's kind of a rule of thumb that if a little story makes sense, it's probably not a koan. There are other kinds of little stories that have something to do with our consciousness, our existence, our body, heart, mind. We could call them spiritual stories that may be very helpful, but are not koans. For example, I think this is a Sufi story. All the fish in the sea have heard of something called the great ocean, but they don't know what it is. So they convene a great council to discuss what is the great ocean, where is it, and how can we find it? Okay, that's the story. So you see the fish in the ocean gathering to discuss. They've heard of this thing called the ocean. What is it? Where is it? How can they find it? They will gather to discuss that. So get the point? They don't realize they're living in it. That's like us. Searching for something that will help us find peace, something greater than ourselves, perhaps, or whatever. And we don't realize we are living in the great ocean of consciousness, of mystery, the, 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 the magnum mysterium, as it's sometimes called, is right here in our ordinary moment. Here it is. But we don't realize that. We think there's something special we've got to figure out and try and find it somewhere other than right here. Okay, so you see how that, you can sort of think through that story. It's got a, it's got a point for us. Or well, there's Tolstoy, his little story of the three hermits, which actually pops up in other, in other traditions. But the, the basics of the story are something like this. A ship is blown off course or, or a, little, a little boat is blown off course and lands on this little island where three hermits are living. They're very pious. They say their prayers every day. But there's a priest on board this little boat that lands by mistake on their island. And um, he overhears them praying. And they've got the prayer wrong. They're not saying it right. And he corrects them. And they're delighted. And they learn the correct way to do the prayer. And then the wind changes and the little party on their boat sails off. But as it's going, um, they see something coming from the island towards them and and they, they so they drop the sail and wait to see what it is and it turns out it's the three hermits walking on the water and they come up to the side of the boat this is this is called the three hermits by the way by tolstoy it's a short short story and 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 so these three hermits come up to the side of the boat and ask for the priest and there he is and they say to him hey we're really sorry we're ignorant simple people we already forgot how we're supposed to say that prayer can you please correct us and tell us how to do it? Remind us again. And the priest says, you know, lads, you've just walked across water. You're doing fine. <laughs> you don't need to correct anything. Just carry on as you are. 
And they say, well, okay, if you don't, if you really think so, and they walk back across the water to their island. So again, there's a point here that we can sort of get, um, you know, the exact form of the prayer in this little story. It doesn't really matter if you got that clear as these guys apparently are. They're so holy, they can walk on water, who cares about the way they pray? You, you get the idea, right? So there's a there's a point that the mind can get. And now we've got a Zen. What's a nice Zen story like? Actually, Zen has little stories here and there that do make a kind of sense. There's a famous one about two monks, a, a, a senior monk and a junior monk. They're walking somewhere and... Uh, and um, they come to a river that they have to cross and there's a, a beautiful young woman there who can't get across and, and um, she's frightened to cross. And, and the older senior monk just asks if it's okay and picks her up and carries her across the river. And the younger monk follows and he's, he's shocked because they take a, they've taken a vow that they're not supposed to touch a woman. And um, they carry on their way and an hour later, the the young monk still sort of fuming and says to the other monk, brother, how could you do that? You know, you, you picked up a woman. What are you doing? And he says, you know, hey, I, I put her down an hour ago and you're still carrying her. So that's got a point. You know, the, the younger monk's hung up on something. The, the wiser older monk is not hung up on it. He's, he's, he's let it go. What are we carrying? What are we hung up on? It's got a point, but this is not a koan. It's not a koan. It's food for the mind. It's, it's food for the same old mind. Nice, helpful food maybe, but it's for the mind. What about this? Whenever he saw someone coming, Rosa faced the wall. Has that got food for the mind? I, I, I hope not. There's nothing for the mind to get there. That's exactly the point. The mind is not going to get fed something more by a koan. The koan is actually about the nature of mind itself. The story of a koan is really the story of the mind itself. It's about the big story. When is this separate sense of me going to realize it is that great ocean. It is already the mystery. This is what the koan is always pointing us toward, inviting us into. If we still think, you know, um, well, it's no big deal sitting facing the wall. What's all the fuss about? But that's understandable, but we're missing the deeper reality. What on earth is going on? Here, now, what is all this? What is this experience called being alive, being conscious? being human. And, you know, we may not exactly get answers to that. In fact, in Zen, we don't really want answers. We can make discoveries, however. Zen can help us make discoveries about what this, this is. When Rosa faces the wall, it's 
It's about us. The story is about us, but we have to fulfill a story. It's the mind doesn't get fed, the mind discovers what it is, something it couldn't possibly conceive about what it is. That's how a koan story, so to speak, gets completed, gets fulfilled, is when our very mind ah, realizes, realizes itself. You know, it's, it's um, actually, <clears throat> um, I heard something on a, a podcast recently. So it's a really clever little podcast where um, there's the, the host um, called um, James Bashara. It's called Below the Line, by the way. He did this mock interview with Alan Watts. So he is interviewing, it seems to be interviewing Alan Watts. So he asked Alan Watts a question. And then he found all these you know, old recordings and edited them cleverly so they answer the question. So it seems like they're having a live interview in 2020. And, um, and one, of the, one of the points Alan Watts makes is this sense of self. We, we don't realize at all that all it actually is, is habits of thought patterns and habits of muscular contraction in the body. We don't realize that that's what it actually is, a sense of self. We get utterly entranced by them, by muscular contractions in the body and patterns of thought and create, self-create the genie of self that entrances us. So in, in analogously to how when we're lost in thought, we don't realize it. We're entranced by the thoughts. And then suddenly, whoa, where have I just been? Oh, I'm back on my cushion now. Ah, great, I made it back. I was entranced by thought, now I'm not. Analogously, to get unentranced by self is to realize, oh my God, excuse my language. Oh my God, it's not strong enough. For 30 years, for 50 years, I've been entranced by something that wasn't real, that I took to be real. Wow, that's waking up from the dream of self. And Rosso has done just that. And because he's done just that, to sit facing the wall. It's, let me say, much more than we would previously have realized. Much more, yeah, I mean, yeah, okay. You could also say <laughs> much less, much less. It's to be alive in an entirely different way. Um, so, so here we go, what, what kind of way? Well, next line of Hongji, seemingly continuing endlessly, yet it is beyond all phenomena. It, Rosso sitting, is beyond all phenomena. You could say it goes on forever, doesn't matter, doesn't really matter. Beyond all phenomena, it's a reality that is beyond all phenomena, phenomena, but is also all phenomena. I mean, if, if we're just seeing the multiplicity of phenomena, we haven't, we, we maybe we haven't yet seen, it's like what they actually are, all these phenomena. And it's the contraction of self that prevents us seeing that. And we can discover this, it's not like a special, special thing. It's, it's only that we're not conditioned. We're conditioned away from it into the contraction so we can't see it. And that conditioning can be released. So here's the thing where, although I'm, you know, you hear me emphasizing mindfulness, how valuable it is, healing, managing, nurturing, cherishing, all of this is so good. 
but at the same time, I must acknowledge that it probably can't, well, it's not designed to release us from the, from in a sense, the basic problem. It's designed to help us manage the basic problem and have it be less problematic, but perhaps not release us from it. That's what this koan way is about. It's actually to, to it, koans are aimed right at me. They're targeting. I mean, I know it sounds a little bit harsh almost, but they are, they're targeting me, the sense of me. They're aimed right at it. They, they're, they're aiming at it. They want it. <laughs> They, the, the masters are trying to help us. This targeting of me, right at you, who we think we are, they're aiming at. You know, they've got their, at the spear point at the heart of who I think I am. Pushing, waiting for the moment when, ah, they can actually push through. And that's me. It's, you could say it's, killed i mean you know there is language about death and stuff in, associated with this but it's not right at all it's like it's seen through what seemed solid is revealed to have been a wisp of smoke uh, you know an angle of light on a cloud that made it look solid and real and we it's very hard to understand that it's not solid and real until we've seen through it. And then we find that actually what we are is all inclusive. We've never been separate from anything. And as I've been saying in these talks, actually that's not the end of the road. What we hope is to go on and on with our training and our practice until we can be like Rosso, just so simple. He's seen all that. Now he just sits. So the next line, rugged, like an idiot, yet his way is lofty. Um, meaning, I think simply, you know, he's kind of rough around the edges. People come to train with him, it just turns and faces a wall not very gracious <laughs> you don't get a nice welcome oh how can i help he just faces it all and yet what a beautiful powerful teaching why so beautiful well let's see next line a gem loses a gem loses its integrity when patterns are carved so this is the idea like a you know beautiful gemstone it gets carved and given facets or whatever, you know, you know, patterns are carved into it, but actually maybe it's more beautiful when it's untouched. And actually the next line is a pearl in the Gulf remains beautiful by itself. That's to say the pearl that's still down in the great Gulf of the ocean. It's beautiful all by itself. It doesn't have to have fancy carving done on it. There it is, resting in the gulf, all by itself. So beautiful. Rosso sitting. It's trying to convey this full integration of awakening where we're just back in normal ordinary mind is the way as actually nansen his dharma brother came to himself as his teaching ordinary mind is the way that too has got the journey in it to discover what ordinary mind is to discover this well empty vast boundless as the sky as nansen himself says that's what ordinary mind is but what does it look like when it's really integrated, sitting, talking, listening, 
going for a walk, going to the shop, doing the shopping, going to work, doing the day's work, interacting with colleagues, driving home, family, taking care of family, maybe cooking, you know, watching a bit of Netflix, going to bed. Could that be it? Could that be the fruit of all our spiritual searching? Could it be? But it's not only is it already here, what we're seeking, but it's, it's already being lived. We're already living it. You know, it's, uh, is it T.S. Eliot, I think he said, one of those famous lines or chunks of his poetry that often get quoted, teach us to sit still. The end of our journeying will be to come back to where we started and know the place for the first time, something like that. If we can just sit still. We're already there. And then the last um, line, actually it's two lines of this verse by Hongji, appreciating Rosa. A fresh air, thoroughly pure, quenches the heat of autumn. I don't know, somehow I, my hunch is a, another translation, maybe more helpful could be like, a fresh breeze, totally pure, quenches the heat of autumn. And we can take that um, metaphorically, that um, Rosa's simple teaching, just sitting, is like a, a cooling breeze in a hot autumn day. Cools the fires of the, of the self, shows us the simplicity that we're seeking and maybe even extinguishes the fires. Um, but we might also just take it literally that he, Rosa sitting facing the wall, there, there's one fact, a cool breeze on a hot day. Another fact, another way the great reality or no, I don't like that. Another way, another instance of this. And then the last line is a piece of leisurely cloud far off separates sky from water. Again, so simple, so beautiful so simple, a cloud low in the sky, far off, separates sky from water. You know, that's it. Not that's a metaphor, that's it. You know, uh, uh, a twig with a few leaves stirs in the morning breeze. There's a, a blurry shadow from the tree outside stirring across the floor. after a period of quiet, the refrigerator clicks on again and hums in the corner. You know, this is our, our life showing itself just as it is. When someone came, Rosa turned and faced the wall.
how lucky we are. How lucky we are. How lucky. Okay, so we'll, 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 we'll stop there. This is the last installment of the four part talk. And I hope it's been some help, somehow, some way, somehow. <laughs> um,